Right, Svet. Oh, the barking. Svet's got barking in the kennel and he walks away. Same thing when he's in the dog box and I walk away, starts barking. Another thing, he's also a bit too keen in front on the long line. Not going as slow as I want him to. Okay. Um, and the barking in the kennel, that type of thing. Um, yeah, I remember your message now. Sorry, mate, I get lots of messages and questions. Um, but I know I remember exactly who you are now. Um, <clears throat> I mean, and I remember in one of your messages, you saying you've been doing the out command, the command of disapproval, ah, and it's not working. Um, next thing is just to up the ante on the pressure, just more pressure. And it's generally pretty easy to start rolling more pressure on a dog in the kennel to get it to shut up, you know. And um, there's a couple of good go-tos with that. One is banging on the kennel. Um, you know, it's a stick or a bit of hose or alkathene and just instead of just sort of going, ah, out, out, with your command of disapproval and walking away, there's not enough comp. Uh, um, there's not enough of a consequence there for the dog, you know, and um, so just escalate it and bang on the kennel and be harsh, man, you know, step it up. Don't just sort of out, stop, you know, being too soft about it. Ah, cut it out, you know, get serious with it. Um, whack on the kennel. Uh, man, banging on a on the don't go too hard out with it because you don't want to damage a hunting dog's hearing any more than you have to. And if you whack on the if the dog's in a box like with the iron roof and you whack on the top of the box, that's going to be really really loud in there. So just keep that in mind. We don't want to go overboard with this stuff. When I talk about rolling on the pressure, adding more pressure, don't go crazy. Um, and and always default back to that that idea of, you know, we talk about in the blueprint a lot, pressure and praise, putting pressure on what you don't want, praise on what you do want. And a really good rule of thumb there is you're always using the minimum amount of pressure or praise required to get the job done. But when it comes to pressure and things like barking in the kennel, if the amount of pressure that you're putting on the dog isn't working, then you need to just slowly up the ante until you see um, a result. Um, banging on the kennel man is a is a really good way but I tell you the best way really really good way and it's it's quiet there's no banging there's no crashing there's no the neighbors here and you're yelling at the dog and banging on the kennel hose man water is a really good way and connect the hose and water to the commanded disapproval so if you're saying out, ah, every time it barks or makes noise, get the hose. And I'm not saying hose down the dog. It, it, they really, really, really don't like this. Um, even a Labrador that loves the water doesn't tend to like being squirted with the hose, particularly when they're in their kennel. You have a dog confined and even just flick, a, flick the hose at them. They don't like it at all. And if you link your commanded disapproval and barking in the kennel to the hose by, and remember timing, don't let the dog bark and make noise for a while and then go out there after a few minutes, be right on it. Timing's very, very important. And as soon as the dog makes noise, so I'll give, I'll walk you through it, exactly what I would do. If my dog barks in the kennel right now, that my three dogs are sitting outside now with the door open, if I heard the, the slightest bark, I'm straight away marking that bark with the command of disapproval. So I'm, the second I hear a bark, I'm, oi! So the dog hears me from inside, ah! The second they make noise, and I'm storming out there. So the second the dog hears a bark, hit barks, they hear me go, ah! And they'll hear me walking outside like that. And then I'm, cut it out. You know, and they're like, Shit, wasn't meant to do that. And then if I, if I turn around and I'm walking away from a dog and it barks, I'm straight away again, ah, 
turn around, walk back out there. Not, not that my dogs don't really bark in the kennel at all, especially not while I'm around because my timing's always been so good and, and I get it good right from the start. Um, actually, Miko, the pup I'm raising and training now, started developing the habit of having a bit of a bark when I left while Henry was home. And um, I told this to Henry, man, you got to be right on it. The second she makes the first noise, get on it, go out there, give her a command of disapproval, and then get the hose. And I'll get to the, I'll get to exactly how to use the hose in a, in a second. But so that's where it starts. This first tiniest noise, ah, and I storm out there. And I stick my head around the corner, cut it out, and they're all like that. You know, they know they're not meant to do it. I turn around and walk away the second they make another noise. I go straight back out there, get the hose. I'll have the hose all set up, ready to go, plugged in, tap on, everything. And it's just a coincidence that, well, it isn't, it isn't, but my hose. What's going on here? Are we still live? Sorry, I've got pop ups popping up. Yep, I think we're still live. Sorry, I just had something popping up on screen there. Um, um, my, I think it's cut out. sucks um, so yeah that cut out that sucks um, but we are recording on the big camera here and we'll, we'll edit it up um, and we'll also work out why Facebook live keeps cutting out I don't know it was I was getting a cr Google Chrome pop-up saying something I don't know what the hell it is um, so, I'll wait, see if Svet's going to jump back on, anyway, so, <clears throat> Yeah, so I have the hose right by the kennel. So it's right there. It's about three, four meters away. And... Oh, bloody... Sorry. The, um, the cut sort of screwed me up there. So, yeah. So the hose is about three or four meters away from the kennel. And if the dog makes a first noise, the second it makes a noise, I'll march, command a disapproval from inside, storm out there, stick my head around the corner, cut it out. And if I turn around and walk away again and the dog tries to start again, the same thing. Ah! I mark the bark with the command of disapproval and that's the main function of that command of disapproval is to mark that bark with pressure as soon as it happens and that's why I want the dog to hear it from inside. As soon as it barks, ah! So any pressure that's coming after that is connected to the bark. As soon as it barks, ah! And I'm storming out there, holding pressure on, come around the corner, cut it, cut it out. Turn around, walk away. If it starts again, same thing, ah! Walk back, grab the hose, Point the hose at it and I'll go, ah, and squirt. So I'm connecting with timing. I'm connecting the command of disapproval with the squirt of the hose. And it's all connected to the bark in the kennel. Now, like I said, you don't have to hose the dog down. Generally, like I'm talking, I've got like a little gun, you know, this pressure, the water gun on the end of the hose with a little fine jet. Generally, like one sort of two second blast, so it's just one little jet of water that, um, you, in the heart, you don't even have to hit the dog, you just sort of hit the kennel. Um, 
and they'll generally shoot straight back in their box if you're, they're in a kennel and run with the box at the back you just give them a little squirt with the gun they'll jump back in the box um, and walk away and if they want to do it again same thing up walk out there grab the hose little squirt with the gun connect it to the commander disapproval and they learn really really quick really really quick um, Yeah, I've had ver the only times I've had dogs persist with barking in the kennel like that is when it's something like a really highly driven male and a bitch is on heat uh, or something like that. But an average dog that um, you're doing everything else right with and you've got dialogue with that dog, whereas it, it understands what a command of disapproval is. If you're following something like the deer dog training blueprint um, you're getting all your other basic training right and again dialogue so bloody important having a dog that knows what up means and they actually look up and take it seriously and then when they do the right thing you say good dog and they relax and you've got dialogue with the dog it's so bloody important um, things like barking in the kennel fixing little bits and pieces like that tend to be really really easy because you can communicate with the dog and tell it what you do and don't want it to do um so yeah that's how i fix um barking in the kennel um i see svet isn't on yet but he can watch the oh no he's back um so the other thing, Svet, you were talking about range. The range isn't your range isn't quite right. Can you throw in the comments there um, how old your dog is, how long you've been training, and how many, what part of the blueprint you're up to? Because that'll be that'll be quite a um, just give me a bit of context on this. Um, generally range and I get this question quite a bit sort of a classic question you know question of you hi Paul I'm following the blueprint um, everything's going really well um, you know everything's going well except the dog's range isn't quite right and nine times out of ten probably actually higher percentage than that um, they haven't got to seven, eight, nine, part seven, eight, and nine when we get right into non communicative stops, non communicative turns, and we're really doing that finishing up work. And it's really, and even eight, part eight is a huge part of the blueprint. And a lot of people follow it. There's a lot of people, and we can see those stats on. Um, Vimeo, how many people have brought the first few parts? Um, we can see, yeah, because back in the day when when um, you could buy the blueprint and parts, well, you had to buy the blueprint and parts because we were selling it as we released it, and that's why it's all set up on the new website. You can only get the whole thing all at once. You can either buy the whole thing all at once. Yep, okay, so Svet said, yep, he pulls on the line in front of me. He's about six months, and I'm at section four or five of the blueprint, part four or five. Yep, so, yeah, four or five. You're not at the part where we start really sorting all that out. He shouldn't be pulling on the long line, and that's using proper use of change of direction. Um, but you'll really be able to understand a lot of that stuff better by watching right through um you're, if you're on four or four or five and you can get the time as soon as possible to sit down and watch seven eight and nine then those three parts seven eight nine are all the finishing work man three four five and six is really just setting up all the tools and the, the foundation of it, seven, eight, nine is, and even 10 is finishing off. 10's almost just coming back for a final check-in on everything that we've done in seven, eight, and nine. 
but 789 man is the real meat and potatoes of the blueprint i mean it's all bloody important but 789 <laughs> for the 10th time that's the finishing work and and there's a huge amount of people that haven't watched it and finished it you know sort of falling a little bit short on it um because five one two three four five and even six gives gives such good results as well but it just doesn't quite finish it off and um, um spending a serious amount of time on that stuff in seven eight and nine that's the finishing work man non-communicative training non-communicative stops really taking the uh, your dog's attentiveness to the next level all that non-communicative training is all about making it the dog's responsibility to watch you instead of your responsibility to handle the dog and um it's something you can't really you definitely you can't explain it properly in a message i can't even explain it properly in a q a but then we explain it properly in the blueprint you know um and we filmed it all you know and it, it took a hell of a lot of time and money to make it and that's why we sell it but um that's my advice on that Svet. hook into seven eight nine ten even like watch ahead um that's quite a good thing to do too man is watch ahead in the blueprint because um and wrap your head around where you're going because um not that you want to be moving ahead too fast but if you watch ahead and and you know where you're going and you know we, how you're going to be finishing everything off then what you're doing today in part five with a six month old dog makes more sense and you're relaxed because you're like oh well, i'm not even meant to have perfect attentive attentiveness now i'm just setting up the foundation for that and i'm going to finish it off in in, in those later parts you know but um yeah Seven, eight, nine, man, it's it's a biggie. Any other questions? Go, Jim. How's it going, mate? Long time no see. Jonathan Henson, um, you asked a question a while ago, and I think I stuffed up, and I did. I was no, I was just like flying through approving a bunch of stuff and i don't know it disappeared but um, um so one thing i'll say on this is with this inner circle on um, in, in jonathan said in that post um that he hasn't bought the blueprint but he's been hanging around for a while and he's interested to learn and i'm adding the occasional person to the inner circle that hasn't brought the blueprint yet but I'm only adding people that I recognize that have been um, hanging around the page for, and some people have been hanging around for years, always got good stuff to say, always asking genuine questions, and I've got a lot of time for people like that, whether they've brought the blueprint or not. It's when a random name pops up that hasn't brought the blueprint, I'm near, I don't recognize their name, they haven't been a good follower and commenter and stuff and they want to get in i'm not adding people i don't recognize but people that are just positive genuine um i'll let you in you know and you can come in and have a look around and ask some questions and i'll answer them too um stuart cooper hey how do i stop my pup from jumping up on people she's six months old and just loses control around other people she won't listen to the command of disapproval once she starts jumping up. Um, the long line, man, and keeping things structured. Um, and so, yeah, two things there is how do I stop my pup from jumping up on people with a long line? And um, um, she's your pup's still young. And... Um, you know depend you know every dog's different we're actually this is something we're working through with miko at the moment and the palmiko dog guide miko's a real forward confident pup you know in the blueprint we talk about choosing that pup that sits back the nice quiet um reserved pup that's more of a sit back observer for a nice quiet indicating dog 
Um, Miko's the complete opposite, and I kind of did that on purpose too because I wanted more forwardness and confidence and a dog that was going to give me more to work with for the Palmico Dog Guide, and that's sort of manifesting in Miko. And she's just super social, man. Like a stranger, a group of strangers on the beach, she's just flying up to them super confident. Um, and I've almost on purpose not done tons of work screwing down, screwing that down. And now we're, we're making a whole couple of massive videos talking about all the finer points of handling and stopping dogs jumping up and stuff. And the Palmico dog guy, but um, um, Stuart, yeah, long line and all of the same principles. If, if you're getting into a situation with your pup, where you're losing control of it in that situation, I would start doing some structured training and work um, in that situation with the long line on, got using all the proper techniques and principles, you know, not holding pressure on the long line, only using it to check the dog. Slack long line, as soon as the pup jumps, give it a check, as soon as it pauses, and all feet, four paws are on the ground, give it a pat. So that's just classic pressure on what you don't want, praise on what you do want. And again, we talked about this recently in another Q&A, um, talking about this a lot, that's why I'm hammering it out in the Palmico Dog Guide. Um, with that, with jumping up with pups, super, super common mistake that I see is People putting pressure on the pup when it jumps up, saying, ah, no, get down. So that's marking what you don't want. It's really, really important to mark the fact that the dog's doing the right thing when it's doing the right thing too. That's the huge unlock, is catching the pup out when it's got all four feet on the ground. It's not mouthing yet, it's not trying to bite, it's not pouring yet, it's not jumping up giving it a pat there. So it sort of looks like as soon as the pup jumps up, ah, push it down or pull it down with the long line. And as soon as its front feet hit the ground, give it a pat there. You've got to, you've got to show them what you don't want them to do, but it's also really, really important that you give them that positive alternative. If you just keep putting pressure on what you don't want, nah, get down, get down. But you don't give the, they just they just want attention. That's what they're jumping up is. They're looking for attention. So you've got to put them in the position where you want them. All four feet on the ground, not jumping up, and give them a pat there. And and if it's kind of at the point where you can't control it, I mean six month old pup, you should be able to control it on a long line, you know? And, and if I if you couldn't can't control it off the long line, I'd set it up. Actually, go okay, kids or whoever you're doing it with. This is what we're doing with Miko. I'm saying okay, I'm coming, bringing Miko around. Can we just spend ten minutes with my nephew, um, doing practicing some calm interaction with Miko, correcting her when she jumps up, having her on the long line, pulling her back, sitting her down, and just getting her practicing sitting and patting. So so calm interaction super super important she won't listen to the command approval once she starts jumping up yep so you've got to just take that next step be super proactive about it put the long line if you ha on if you have to and that huge key man praise them when they're doing the right thing don't you can't do it with only one or the other you can't ignore the bad stuff and just praise the good stuff it doesn't work you can't just put pressure on the bad stuff and ignore the good stuff. That doesn't work either. It's 50-50. It's pressure on what you don't want, praise on what you do want. And if and with the pup, and this is the hard thing with this excited interaction, is sometimes it can be difficult to get that two or three seconds where a pup's sitting, doing what you want to give it some praise. And you've really got to try to catch them out even if if they keep jumping up, up, put the push them down, and then they might get distracted and look the other way for a second, dart in then and give them a pat with all four feet on the ground. The second they spin around and go to jump up, up, release the praise. 
And then if they get distracted, all four feet on the ground dart back in again and they'll start to get it. Oh, every time I jump up, it's pressure and praise is removed. Every time all my four feet on the gr are on the ground and I'm not biting, I'm getting a pat. And they start to go, oh, hang on. I might just stand here and not be an idiot and I get praise. And then you start to get that really nice setup where when a pup wants attention or a dog wants attention, they come in and just sit down and look up. And that's that nice attentiveness. And if you look at the way we train our stop drill in the blueprint, getting the dog to sit, stepping back, walking around, stepping in, giving a pat, stepping back. That's all about getting attentiveness, calm interaction and all of that. So that's another huge one. Stuart is really look at your stop drill and look at how that whole thing works because <clears throat> that's what that whole thing is. Um, Svet, he appreciates that. He'll watch them today and have a look. He took him out for the first time yesterday and he was keen as no problems. Okay, I'm not sure what that means, but yeah, have a look at those, man. Give that um, kennel thing a go. The hose, don't bloody go overboard and hose your dog down or, you know what I mean? Timing and linking that um, command of disapproval. And yep, check out 789, man, non-communicative training. And, and both of these questions, Vet and Stuart, they're young dogs, man. They're both six months old, so they're not meant to be perfect yet anyway. Jared, how's it going? On the same topic, our dog, the non-communicative stops are still pretty solid, but the range is not what it was. The dog's quite often willing to fall into a loop of doing a lot of turns. And we end up walking back and forth. Watch the whole blueprint. Oh, he's watched the whole blueprint now and it is a good idea to move ahead into 789, command of disapproval and decrease long line use. Or should I keep at the turns until he settles back into keeping range again? Man, some of this stuff gets really hard when you're not seeing exactly what's going on, eh? Um, and that's another thing, guys is getting videos of exactly what you're doing. Um, Cause it can be like a one-on-one -on -one session where I did a one-on-one -on -one session just the other day and it's you, it's very, very common that uh, someone will send me a couple of emails, hi, I'm trying to fix this and I sort of try to tell them how to do it. And then they're not getting it and they're not getting it. And we can't work out what it is <clears throat> as soon as we, they put the long line on and we walk for three minutes, I can see what it is, you know. So that that is another big one with this inner circle, guys, is um, Jared, get if you can do that, man, get some footage, even a three or four minute video, get it as good as you can on your phone and throw it up in the inner circle and I can have a look at it and throw some suggestions out there. Um, sometimes there's, I can pick up things real quick. Um, super simple and just your timing or something's a little bit off could be the way you're holding or managing the long line little things like that um, that's probably the most common one jared is this bit of stab in the dark here but um when someone's dog isn't getting the range quite right with non-communicative stops and turns and things it's usually the way they're holding the long line and the dog is monitoring itself through the long line and the checks aren't coming as a surprise. It's a really, really big one. And, and yeah, either the long line's too short or you're, you're gathering the long line up in your hand. You're not properly holding the, end, the very end of the long line, keeping slack in the long line and every time that dog just switches off and goes to wander out, actually give it a proper check and the check has to be a, su a surprise. If there's any warning at all before the dog gets that turn, whether that warning is you going up, 
giving it a command of disapproval and then a check or even something to do with your hands or your feet moving or you let the dog walk out too far on the long line and the dog feels that last meter or two of slack pulling out of the long line before you give your check you need to give your check before that so let so start giving it earlier and that turn and that check has to be a surprise so the only way the dog can avoid it is by watching you using its its peripheral vision and it in its eyes and ears and every time it switches off and goes to break it, its range it gets a check that it's not ready for that's it's pretty much the only reason why it doesn't work um, and it can be very very subtle and quite hard to just get that just right but when you do the dogs change real quick and um highly driven dogs intelligent dogs dogs with a lot of go like gsps and stuff man they get real good at reading that long line and and preempting those turns and checks and stuff and you've got to get just as sharp and as consistent as them and really call them out on it and surprise them um let me know if that rings a bell yeah I'd, oh yep yeah. and yeah get a video that'd be interesting but that little spiel I just had there might ring a couple of bells um, and you can think about it on your next session too um, Matt Olson anything I can do to help a new pup get used to being alone it's a second day okay straight away super super early days it's a second day and he stops crying after 20 minutes or so but starts and stops often he is still whiny when out of the kennel and with people okay Matt super super early days man and um, really really common even if you're doing everything perfectly and and you're quickly moving towards the point where your dog's gonna be good as gold really really common to have a little bit of whining and off and on and stuff over the first week or 10 days and if you really stick to all those principles in the blueprint um super common question um <clears throat> you'll get there you know and and this is in lot, lots of q and a's and different videos and things um it's a real common one from the messages private messages is um on day two probably all I need to say is just keep doing what you're doing and by day seven or eight you'll be good as gold um, one thing I can see from that question is anything you can do to get the pup used to being alone question mark it's his second day and he stops crying after 20 minutes or so but starts crying he stops crying after t but starts and stops often really good Matt if a pup cries for 20 minutes and it goes quiet for two go out to it teach the pup that being quiet is what causes you to turn up again that's just well this isn't so much putting pressure on what you don't want it's ignoring what you don't want and not giving the pup a positive result for it as soon as the pup relaxes go out to it and mark that with hey as soon as you're quiet you turn up and you can actually teach a pup that the best way to get you to come back is to be quiet um that can work really really well and then you just slowly try to increase that patience by if, if the pup's getting into a pattern of being quiet and starting up again quite regularly and and the the gaps are short so it's only going quiet for a couple of minutes and then starting back up again start going out to it as soon as it goes quiet man even if it's quiet for 30 seconds turn up as soon as it goes quiet um and then next time it'll probably go quiet for a minute and then next time try to leave it for five minutes and then all of a sudden it'll be quiet for half an hour and you'll turn up and then and you'll be making really good progress one thing you got to be careful a little bit careful is or just this can speed the whole process up is um 
yeah, if it makes noise for 20 and then it goes quiet for 15 minutes and starts up again at 20, you kind of miss the boat. Really, really good to turn up while they're quiet. But again, super early days, man. And um, stick to your guns. Keep ignoring it. Don't go down the route of, oh, just start, go you know, poor puppet's crying. I'll go and let it out and give it a pat to make it feel better. That's training it to make noise to get let out and get a pat. You want to train it to be quiet, to be let out and get a pat. And um, <clears throat> with the whining thing while you're with it, you're saying it still whines sometimes when people are with it. Um, then super young pup, just try to keep it positive, build a bond, you know. Um, I really try to hammer that home in part one. Any training we're doing in part one when the pup's tiny, we're just trying to link actions to commands. We're not doing any, you know, um, any um, serious work there. And just try to keep it light, man, and give your pup a pat and pick it up and give it a cut. Try to create that bond and let it know that, um, you know, you're its mate. And, and that'll, you know, a pup that's whining when you're with it, is why is, is it's it's whining for its litter mates in a in a in a bond you know so really tried to um develop that bond man and just stick to your guns and all that other stuff i hope that makes sense um jared should add the turns i'm taking i'm talking about a non-communicative turns to keep range yep I, I knew that's what you were meaning um jared yeah definitely man get a Try to get a video, um, yeah, oh yeah, further down the comments. Makes good sense. It was working well, been trying hard to make sure it's slack on the ground, but could be body language or something. He'll get a, but he'll get a video. Yeah, just the cat man, the old GSP dude, they are, they are very, very sharp. And any little cue out of the corner of their eye or you, Look, grabbing the long line, just yeah, just have a think about that whole thing about him preempting it somehow. Nick, on your next training session, see if you can pick anything up and get a video. I reckon we'll um, we'll help you get on top of that. Um, Al Chester only barks at new people when they come into work. I've been working with disapproval, same as the dog box on the truck, he's fine in the truck now, but the workshop's another story. His question is. Is barking pr protecting property a huge problem? <clears throat> Man, that, that super instinctive barking, and particularly that, it's just like one or two barks, that whoa, when, when they hear or see something, um, that can be a hard one to completely get rid of in some dogs. Vizslas and GSPs, and some of those breeds are really bad for it. I don't find heading dogs that uh, it's not that ingrained. Vizslas are a classic for it, and some really good Vizslas that I know of some older Vizslas that are really good, super experienced, five or six years old, hunting full time, and all of that, and they'll still do it, much to their owner's dismay, in the bush. Um, while they're hunting and they'll do it they'll be asleep they'll actually literally be asleep and they'll almost like do it out of their sleep like waking up to surprise that they'll, and they'll tell you this and i've seen them do it the dog will be asleep and it'll wake up barking it'll just wake up whoa, whoa, like that and then it almost realizes what it was doing and it's like it's just like a weird reaction like a twitch that they've got and you can put tons of pressure on it every time they do it, cut it out to the point where when they do it, they'll bark, whoo, and then cower and go, oh shit, I wasn't meant to do that. Um, <clears throat> it can be that, you know. Um, Miko's got it a bit. She's half Vizsla, real classic, and she'll just do it. She knows she's not meant to. She gets pressure every time she does it. Uh, every now and again, It'll, and it's just that it's a different type of bark. It's not sharp. It's not aggressive. It's that real. Ooh. <laughs> you 
Yeah, and she does it. Um, I just put pressure on it every time. And those things, man, super, super, if you want to get on top of it, super, super consistent, put pressure on it. But then again, the last part of that question, is barking to protect property a huge problem? It's not if it's not a problem for you, man. Like there's no, you know, and, and I don't actually mind. Personally, I would, I, I definitely want to keep it to a very, very low level, but I actually like, my dogs know they're not meant to go crazy. Print will do it too. Fly barely barks. Print will do just like one bark, a quiet bark when someone walks down my driveway or comes to the gate. Um, so will Miko, just one or two barks. If they do any more than that, I'll be, ah, cut it out. And they know, just one bark. And I don't mind that, man. I definitely don't want them barking at bloody someone moving next door on the neighbours or walking past the footpath, on the footpath or something like that. That's completely unacceptable. But one or two barks when someone is actually coming right into my section, I don't mind that. And it's actually, um, it's just good. So, yeah. There's a heap of notes on that, and but it's not inherently bad. It's no, you know what I mean? As long as it's not getting completely out of hand, you know, and you can control it. Just that one or two barks, hey boss, someone's here, is, isn't crazy. Um, Stuart Cooper will give that a go. Another question he has is, she is real inconsistent. She can be great on her sits and even range for a few days then just not respond on the next day. Yep, she's six months old. Um, you know, and that's why, um, that's why we don't hunt the dog till it's at least, you know, 12 months old. Some, we've had a few people start earlier than that. Um, but you know, the blueprint's set up so it can work for basically anyone and any type of dog and that's why it's so in depth and that's why we don't rush it. Um, and inconsistency is a huge part of a young dog being a young dog, you know. Um, and that's why in, in, if she's six months, you're still on part four. Um, theoretically, anyway, you might still be brushing up on things from part three and you might be bringing a few things forward from part four or five um but you're on part four of a 10 part training system and that's basically just brings me back to the earlier points that um you know hugely part four five six is really just laying that foundation and trying to get that consistency you know you're just working on it and just repeat 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 um super consistent and that consistency comes with time man and and a six month old pup that isn't perfectly consistent on its sit is totally acceptable and that's why we keep training till 12 months old so um you know definitely if you're having some consistency issues a couple of ideas um you know maybe have a rewatch of the sit drills and what I'm doing with range, make sure all your timing and techniques are bang on. Make sure there's nothing that you're doing that's confusing the dog. Um, yeah, and then from there, just just patience, man. And just keep repeating and repeating and just let consistency come on over time. It's huge. Um, how do I get around... Matt Olson, how do I get around it while I'm at work? I've got a big blowfly buzzing around in here. Uh, hey, anything I can do to help? I'm just trying to remember what your question was, man. Oh, how do you get around it while I'm at, while you're at work? Yeah, and it's hard. It is hard that Matt the the barking and whining. Well, I'm guessing you're meaning. I need a little plenty of information on these questions, man. Um, how do you get around it while you're at work? Do you mean while the pup, how do you get around it while you're leaving the pup at home while you're at work or is the pup with you while you're at work? Um, yeah, cheers out. See you next time, man. Um, yeah, it is a real hound bark. 
It is. That real woo. Um Yeah. Is the yeah, Matt, is the dog with you while you're at work? Or um you're meaning while you're at home? Oh sorry, while the dog's at home while you're at work. If it's with you, it's the same thing. If it's while you if it's while you're not with the dog, it's really hard, you know, and, and that's why, um, that's a huge part of the reason why I'm so huge and why we did it in the blueprint. Really ripping the band-aid off, man, and putting that pup in the kennel right on day one and letting it cry it out. And, and I've said this in a lot of Q&As too, um... Um, hey, Henry, can you just pass there? There's a can of fly spray on the um, shelf over there. This, um, just to your right, right in front of you. Not just right in front of you, dude. Just to your right. What? <laughs> it's right, not nah, next, next shelf down. Yeah. Yep, that shelf. Yep. On the right hand side of that. Yep. Oh, yep. <laughs> Sweet dude. Cheers. Cheers, mate. The um, flies bloody triggering my ADD, eh? There we get him. Um, what was I talking about? Uh, yeah, that question, Matt. Yep, dog will stay at home. Yeah, it's a hard one, man. You know. Oh, I can get someone to come and let it out, but it will be at home. That's awesome. If you can get someone to come and let it out, and that's why, again, going back to what I was saying before um, that blowfly got the better of me, um, that's why I hook in right from day one, man, right from the start with kenneling. Um, we, we're doing the same thing with crating in the Palmico dog guide. Um, we literally take the crate with us when we pick the pup up. So, like, I literally pick the pup up when I get it and it goes straight in the crate and it's half used to sleeping in the crate by the time we get home because and then we start putting the crate in the kennel we do tons of stuff man right from the minute I pick the pup up because most people have to go hopefully you can pick the pup up on a Saturday morning and spend all weekend just ripping the band-aid off on kenneling and crating so by the time monday comes around you're already that first step of the way there we've got our principles of first exposure and doing the worst first and all of that sort of stuff um because the the opposite of that and what a lot of people do is um you know just with people that just don't know about dog training and just want to get a dog and just want to wing it is pick the pup up on a Saturday morning and the pup rides on their lap on the way home and sleeps on the bed at night and is just glued to them all weekend and then Monday morning they put it in the kennel and go to work and the pup just goes ape shit all day and then they get home let the pup out and the pup stays with them all night and they put the pup back in the kennel and it goes ape shit all day. And that's how you teach separation anxiety. Um, you're literally training it in. People say my dog's my dog suffers from separation anxiety or my dog's got separation anxiety like it's some disease that they catch. You train your dog to be anxious while it's not with you, you know, and you can train a dog to be relaxed while it's not with you too, and there's a process for both. Um, so it's all, it all, no matter what your dog, I'm writing about this in the Palmico dog guide, your dog's always a mirror. Anything that it does is because of something you or someone else around you or your dog has done. That's it. Um, but I'm sort of going on a bit of a tangent here, but, um, just trying to cover as many good points on this as I can for, for Matt and anyone else listening. Um, yeah, the answer is it's hard, Matt. 
and that's why we just hook in right from the start man and really stick to your guns and you'll usually get on top of it within the first week or 10 days but full disclosure the first week or 10 days can be very rough for people even when they're doing it properly but if you do it properly it's only a week or 10 days and then you've got the rest of your dog's life where it's sorted and relaxed if you if you don't stick to the rule book in those first week in their first week or 10 days you can easily get into a situation where you're going to have issues for the rest of the dog's life and it can be a, a real pain in the ass um so that's awesome if someone could come around during the day and let your pup out that's really good give it a toilet break out of the kennel a bit of a run around stuff that's bloody good but answer that question is what do you do about it while you're at work the answer is you can't do anything and that's why it's so important to get everything right while you're home right from the start um, hope that makes sense Brenton Woda, how's it going? If I shoot a deer with the bow and then wait for things to settle before we follow it up, or if we bump a deer and then track slowly, Lexi will do a very small whine. How do I prevent this from getting worse without putting too much pressure and affecting prey drive? The answer's in the question. Don't worry about affecting prey drive, you know, and, and, I mean, worry about affecting prey drive, but if, if you've trained your dog properly for 12 months and done all your scent work and steadiness work and you've shot a few deer over it and it's cranking and now it's whining while it's taking you to a shot deer or it's whining while you're tracking a spook deer, don't worry about reducing prey drive, man. Put pressure on it and you can put a lot of pressure on it. And if you don't, you could unravel some pretty big problems for yourself that could escalate. Um, definitely, once again, as long as you've done everything right, you people, you, you can affect prey drive massively or... or it's very difficult to completely erase prey drive and have a dog that doesn't want to hunt, but people stuff up the way their dogs can hunt all the time by not training them properly and then just taking them hunting and winging it and putting pressure on the dog before it knows how to hunt properly. And that's a really, really important part of having a proper training system that trains properly. So you don't have to put a huge amount of pressure on a dog to keep things relatively controlled while you're hunting. You've done all that in the absence of game and hunting. And now that you're hunting, you have all the tools that you need to manage and control your dog without putting excessive negative pressure on it while it's trying to hunt, which can really stuff a dog up. That's, again, it's something I've talked about a lot. In Q&As, it's a super, super in-depth, like deep, so that it can get a bit esoteric, easy to miss. I could talk you could talk about it for hours but really important to set up all your structure first so the first few hunts go re relatively smoothly with minimal pressure then what happens is the dog starts gaining confidence it knows exactly what it's doing and usually a dog that's whining after the shot or whining because you spooked a deer it's whining because you've shot a few deer over and it's going man i want to repeat that because it was really cool so it starts whining and doing silly stuff and at that point man you can start rolling the pressure on pretty hard without affecting drive the dog knows what you're there to do you just got to remind it and keep shaping that it's got to keep doing it the way you want to do it um bloody important and that's a pretty that can be a relatively common mistake um but yeah and i want to be really careful with saying that because there's two really common mistakes here and they're sort of opposites is one really common mistake is not training properly before you start people start and that, this is where you talk people end up having a dog that will track 
but won't win or will win but won't track and stuff like that because the dog was trying to track one day and it broke its range and the person was like hey stay close and the dog thought oh shit I'm not meant to track that deer but that's why we get all of that crap out of the way in the blueprint that's why we train for 12 months and do all our scent work and we spend so much time setting everything up that's why we set up our stop go and turn and range before even before we do scent work you know and that's why we do the scent work the way we do it so if the dog does go out of its break its range we can turn it and then bring it back to the scent whereas you can't do that sort of thing if your dog starts tracking a deer mark and loose dry leaves and you haven't set up your range properly yet and you have to give it a command of disapproval give it a tune up to try to sort your range out and you break the dog's concentration you don't know where that scent is and you can't follow it now you've just broken your dog off tracking a real deer in the bush and people that don't train properly before they hunt that's often all they're doing on their first few hunts and then they wonder why it takes them three years to get their dog hunting properly because it actually takes three years to undo all of the damage they did in that first few months and that's why when you when you train properly you can actually get dogs hunting really really well like straight out of the gate um so i hope that makes sense man um brenton but yeah once they're cranking properly and you've done everything properly shot a few deer you can put quite a bit of pressure on the man and, we, and i go over that in the blueprint too you know um, I'm giving Print the command of disapproval for, for he's in range, but if he makes a bit too much noise scrambling over a log or something, I'm like, cut it out! I'm putting pressure on him while we're hunting. It's in the blueprint. It's in um, 11 and 12. Yeah, there's actually a, quite a part on it, um, hunting Seeker in the Kaimanawas. Um, and I shot a few deer over him. He's going bloody good. He's in his range, but... It's not as if he's breaking range or making tons of noise. He's not going as quietly as he could be. And I start putting subtle pressure on that every time they, he scrambles over something. Ah! And you actually get the dog to the point where they try to scramble, make a bit of noise. And I'm like, oh, shit, not meant to do that. And they actually consciously try to go quietly. I'm actually bringing out that, that sneak. Matt Olson, he's a bad pointer. Don't know what that means. Um, Svet, I have no problem with my dog following instructions, but as soon as my partner tries controlling him, giving commands, he won't listen to her at all. Is, is it something addresses later on in the blueprint? Not really, but it's that questions addressed in all of the principles and stuff um but and and this is the whole point of these q and a's um um i got a bloody fly back um a couple of things there really good Svet, if you can get your partner doing some of the um, training, you know. Um, if your pup's listening to you really well, but not your partner, there's obviously something, there's differences between, you know, what you and your partner are doing. Um, um, yeah, it, it, and, and a lot of people do that too, and that, that's actually one really good thing about following a system like the Blueprint um as couples can watch it together whole families can watch it you know and and everyone can use the same commands and techniques and all of that and and generally if one person like if, if your dog's listening really well with you and you're setting that foundation your partner shouldn't have to do anywhere near as much work as you but if she sort of follows suit and uses the same commands and follows the same principles um your dog should fall into line pretty quick with her as well um so that's a big one um and and another big one here is um obviously you know that's a we say it over and over and over 
every time you get it give a dog a command that it doesn't listen to is teaching it that it doesn't have to listen to you you know and, and that's why we train the way we train with the long line and setting the dog up to get everything right and it basically can't fail and all of that um just make compliance habit and we basically try to avoid any situation where um you give a command that the dog doesn't listen to um so it is quite important that that whatever's happening that there's not other people in the environment that are giving a pup or dog loads of commands that it's not listening to um because that sort of thing can bleed over into what you're doing with your dog and it can really it, it really can man it can really seriously affect um your dog overall if you're doing everything right and there's someone else that it's not quite clicking with it's not really ideal so um um I mean, there's two sides to that. <clears throat> On the one hand, the, the, oh, there's a saying that I've said a lot of times too, and that it's not always important what your dog experiences with someone else, but it's very important what it experiences with you. So your dog can learn that it can get away with stuff with someone else, and it doesn't get away with it with you, and that can work to a certain extent. But it's definitely better. It's about good, better, best. You know, your dog listening to you really well and not your partner is good because it's listening to you. Your dog listening to you really well and kind of listening to your partner is better. Your dog listening to both of you really well is the best. So that that would be awesome if you could get there. Um, and you just do that by the exact same thing, man, your partner just getting on board. And she doesn't have to do the whole blueprint and skin work and <laughs> um, scent training and gunfire and all of that, but um, just the super basics of, of a recall and stop when it listens, you know, sitting when she says sit and not moving until she, say, until she gives the release command and basics like that. Um, it can be really, really good to, to try and get other people in the household on board with that type of thing. Um, Matt Olson, sweet, looks like I'm in for a long week. Yeah, man. Um, yeah, it was a joke about... Oh, it was a joke about you're looking for the fly spray. Never mind. Oh. <laughs> yeah, the fly, <laughs> the fly spray. Um, yeah, she was a goodie. Um, it's something I'll do though, it's bloody something right in front of me and I'm not seeing it. Um, uh, yeah, sorry, I got sidetracked there. Um, but yeah, man, I think were we met, yeah, we were talking about the kennel. First week can be a long week, man, and that's sort of what I say to people too, like, some, so I'll get a message, you know, people will be like, um, hi, Paul, following the blueprint, everything, everything's going really well except my pup's making quite a bit of noise in the kennel and sometimes an answer that has worked a lot in the past is okay that's kind of how the first week is stick to the plan write it out for another few days or a week and come back to me if you're come back to me both either way come back to me if it doesn't work and let me know if it does work and your dog's quiet and Pretty much everyone comes back and says, well, that was a bloody big week, but my dog slept through last night. And then you talk to them again a month later or a year later, and man, my dog's really good in the kennel, and it's been awesome, you know what I mean? So it is meant that first week can be rough. You're not going to get as much sleep um, as you used to with a young pup like that. Um... Any more questions? We're at an hour. Out. We're at an hour ten. And I was thinking of maybe trying to get to a point or a routine where we're doing these calls for an hour about once a week. Maybe throwing an extra one in here or there. We might miss a week occasionally and then or something. But um, Luke Gordon saying Matt Olson plus one what Paul is saying, oh, plus one, so he's saying, he agrees with what Paul is saying, if he's only crying for 20 minutes at a time, that's doing all right, yeah, and he's right, 
My boy would go for hours at a time initially, but was sweet after about five days or so. So that's a bloody good point, Luke. <laughs> Matt, if he's only doing 20 minutes at a time, you're actually doing pretty good. Um, yeah, and you're right, Luke. <laughs> yeah, 20 minutes at a time and having to get up once a night, that's going all right. Um, we've had people, for whatever reason, I actually think it's often to do with the pup's living situation leading up to being weaned and going to new homes. You know, some people, you know, that the parents of the pups or the mum of the pups might live inside and be completely unkenneled and live in the, in the, you know, in the corner of the kitchen or something. And people are always there. People are always hovering around the pups and the pups aren't used to being quietly in a corner on their own, you know. Um, um, you know, every pup's situation is very, very different over the first eight weeks and that has a huge, huge impact on how difficult it is for people to crate train their pup during that first week. And... Um, I think that's a huge reason why a lot of um, people that get heading dog pups breeze straight through it because a lot of heading dog pups come from farm backgrounds where um, the pups are A, raised outside or in a shed or in a kennel. Um, they're often in a situation where there's not people around all the time. So the pups are used to a person not being there all the time, that they're handled and socialized, but they're not overhandled either. Um, and another big one is the pups being in a situation where the bitch actually leaves sometimes, you know what I mean? And and for, for you know, like when, when um, Print and Fly had pups, you know, we looked after them really, really, really well. But um, especially as they got older, you know, the pups are just harassing the hell out of Fly, you know, and climbing all over and she can't sleep and all that. And she was just getting buggered. And um, I actually had a setup where I could separate Fly from the pups, you know. And so the pups were actually getting separation while they were still in the litter. So they were having to get used to getting separated from their mum and people for extended periods of time and in an outside environment, you know. Um... So I think that's actually the main reason why there's a huge variation. Some people go, oh, my pup slept straight through on its first night. Um, or my pup only whines for 10 minutes and then it calms down. Or holy hell, it's day five and my pup's going ape shit all night, every night. Huge amount of that is down to what is the environment the pup's coming from and how is it raised in the first eight weeks. Um, and, and obviously the other variable is, or the other two main variables is the pup, individual pup. Every dog's different. And the and a huge variable is, is the fine tuning of exactly how you're dealing with it, you know. Um, stuff like keeping the pup busy for a long time and getting it tired before you put it in the kennel and walk away. Um, that is going to allow the pup to calm down a lot quicker um, a big mistake is letting the pup hang around with you and letting the pup sleep on sleep with you or on your lap or inside quite a lot and then go and then so letting the pup get a lot of sleep throughout the day without it being separated and then going oh now let's do some kennel training and just do what Paul says and just put the dog pup in a kennel and walk away when the pup isn't tired that's a biggie. It's going to make it harder. Um, so there's lots of variables, you know. Um, going back to it as soon as it's quiet. All of these things. Um, Jonathan Griff. He's not at home during the day, so the missus is with Tui all day. She uses the same commands, hand signals with Tui. Even the kids put her away in the cage think everyone has to be on board think that's very important and to be consistent huge man is so huge you know and that see that's that'll be a huge re part of the reason why you, your dog looks so good 
um, Jonathan, aka Bearded Bushman, he's training a GSP and like right out the gate, right from a young age, he's been posting a few videos and it's just been like, holy shit, that dog's looking good. And people are saying, oh, you've got a good one, mate. Or shit, you've been lucky there. Or man, every, and I saw one comment, one guy was like, every now and again, you fluke a good one. It's not a fluke, man. <laughs> it's not a fluke. And there's so many thousands of variables on, you know, how you can knock it out of the park or how you can not do it as well, you know, that idea good better best you can hit do do it good you can do it a little bit better or you can just do what's best you know and and when you and, you know people say in the blueprint oh you know print so good though and but print easy but prints this but prints that and people are saying it to jonathan griff the bearded bushman oh but you've got a good one but but nah he's just doing it really bloody well and, and yeah, there's exceptions. Some dogs are easier than others, but there's also, you know, every, things happen for a reason. Things are happening the way they are happening for a reason. And that's all there, that's all there is to it, man. Um, the better you do it, the better it goes, you know, and you can go as far as you want with that. Um, yeah. Uh, Matt Olson, yeah, this is his first time alone. There was 10 pups and the mum 24-7. Yep. It's a biggie, man. Um, that whole, like, what is happening with your pup before you pick it up, you know, and, and I, I look at that and think about that and talk to owners about, talk to breeders about that. Um... Yeah, when getting a puppet, I take all that stuff into consideration, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's sort of the idea of these um, Q&As and stuff, like, um, is man, like, some critics of the blueprint say it's too long and too in-depth, but... Um, it's 15 and a half hours long. It could be 115 hours long. You know, you, you could just go forever on this stuff. Um, and that's the whole idea of, of all the follow-up stuff we do with the blueprint. And that's the idea of these Q&As in the inner circle and all of that too, you know. Um, and if anything, we're probably going to do more of this over time. Um, you know, we obviously we're flat out making the, the um, blueprint. And now we're flat out making the the Palmico dog guide, and um, we've got other stuff that we want to make. And, and really looking at this whole thing of training people to train dogs is super, super long term, you know. And um, um, trying to build a foundation of stuff like the blueprint and the Palmico dog guide, and we've got other products we're going to make too. And then and then we really want to get to a point where. We can start spending less time making those foundational products and more time just backing them up with stuff like this because you can just talk about this stuff forever, you know. Um, yeah. Can you, uh, Steve Joshua, can you start with rabbit pelts and switch later to deer? Uh... That'll train your dog to hunt rabbits um i wouldn't recommend that man just to be frank about it yeah really really good if you can get excuse me if you can get hold of some deer skin and do it with that um yeah we're about to you base steve there's something else we can maybe do in the inner circle here is um guys can help each other with skin deer skin um because it's sort of one of those things where some people are throwing it away while another guy's looking for it to train his dog and you don't need much either because you can reuse it um maybe that's something we can help each other out with but yeah I, you know i wouldn't recommend using rabbit skin and then switching to deer later on having said that though 
if someone was living on the moon and all they had was a piece of rabbit skin and then they were going to come back to earth and hunt deer I would say yep do your scent work with rabbit skin because with a lot of that scent work we're not actually it's not about training the dog to target that scent that's just a big added bonus of what we're doing the main the the most important part of the skin work that we do in the deer dog training blueprint is training a dog how to track training you how to training someone that's never done all of this stuff how to read a dog properly and how it all works and training a dog to to learn to to stay on a scent keep you in the back of its mind keep its range follow direction not switch from scent to scent and all of the things you know it's, it's there's a lot to it it's all in the blueprint we could talk about it forever but that's that's the most important part of it it's way 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 more important all of that stuff teaching the handler how to read and follow the dog teaching the dog how to follow scent and teaching control while following scent I would way rather do that with you could do that with anything you could do that with the piece of clothing that smells like you and you're training a dog how to follow a scent i'd probably rather do that with it with an inanimate object or just a random scent like exactly that's probably what i would use as a piece of clothing that smells like you because again the most important part of all that scent training isn't to teach the dog how to track a piece of deer skin any uh, any a heading dog any hunting breed dog anything if you haven't stuffed it up and you've done all your training right the first time that any top any of those dogs smells where a deer has walked it's going to put its nose down and show interest and if you you've done everything right and you know how to read a dog you're going to see that react to it accordingly and encourage the dog to follow it up and that's where you get a well-trained young dog tracking its first deer perfectly and a dog well-trained young dog should be able to do that and i've done that with dogs over and over again where a young dog's tracked its first deer for kilometers you know or wind or taken me hundreds of meters in on the wind perfectly on the first deer it's ever smelt in the bush because i've done all my training right i have dialogue with the dog i know how to read it the dog knows how to react to me it knows all of that stuff and it's a dog and dogs are interested in hunting stuff you know what i mean um and and you know back in the day like back in the day i didn't even do skin work i just taught all my range and everything and just went hunting and the dogs did the exact same thing and again like we sort of go over the we go full on with all of that stuff in the blueprint because it's made for guys that haven't even hunted or trained a dog before and a huge amount of it is about training the person as well as the dog you know so um if you use rabbit skin you're teaching your dog to target rabbits but again it's not even about it's not really about that um steve joshua oh he's in you're in florida okay you can grab roadkill <laughs> um man it would be awesome if you could track down a piece of deer skin steve um yeah if you can put the feelers out and there's a lot of these a lot of good hunting groups you know like i don't know what the deal is in florida but here we've got facebook hunting forum groups you know like we've got the new zealand venison hunters and there's a few others um and people are out shooting deer all the time there's a lot of good bastards on there too and if you put a post up on some of those pages saying hi guys i'm training a deer dog and i really want a piece of deer skin you know if so, i'm sure if someone there's a lot of people on follow big game indicating dogs shooting deer every week and I'm sure if someone put a post up, hi guys, I'm looking for deer skin, I reckon you get answers pretty quick, you know. 
Um, and he's saying, yeah, I will, thanks, sweet. Uh, Jonathan Griff, those comments of people saying, I've got a good one. That's not all true. She's hard work, typical GSP. Just been, I've just been consistent with her from the start. And with the whole family on board, she's clearly my dog. If anyone was worried about their pup getting mixed signals of who's the boss. Yeah, I totally agree, man. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm a huge believer in, you know, you make your own luck. Huge believer in that. You know, my, my book's called Hunting Lucky. But if you read it right to the end, um you'll see that that's a bit of a um there's a bit of sarcasm in that in that title um the harder you work the luckier you get and all that sort of stuff um yeah oh i might unless someone wants to throw another comment up right now i might scoot on out of here Um, we're doing another one on Palmico at two. Another Q and A. Go, Mike. How's it going, mate? Um, yeah, these Q and A's, man, they throw a lot of good info around, and um, putting them up on the podcast. The only problem with them is they get long, you know. That's why putting them up on the podcast um, is really good. So you can listen to them when you're driving, you can listen to them when you're doing other stuff. It's bloody good. Audio is good. Um, yeah. Um, for anyone that wants to find that, currently the podcast is only on Spotify and iTunes. I think Sp I've got Spotify and I pay for it because I listen to all my music on it. Um, but iTunes is free. Anyone can get download iTunes for free. And then just search Paul Michaels podcast. Um, Paul Michaels podcast, and it'll come up. And there's heaps of Q and A's. This the audio for this Q and A will go on it. Um, so if you if you sort of come in late, and you're listening to the end and thinking, man, I haven't got time to sit down and watch an hour fifteen video, um, yeah, you can listen to the audio. You know. And even if you drive to work 20 minutes every day, you listen to 20 minutes every day until it's done. Um, yeah. Sweet, guys. Thanks for all the questions. These are getting better and better real quick. So um, I'm going to go give my voice a bit of a break. Have a bit of lunch before the Palmico one at two. And... Um, yeah, we'll catch you guys next time. We're sort of, I haven't got a locked in exact time and date that I'm doing these yet. Um, we're saying roughly, at, at the minimum, at the moment, I'm doing one every two weeks in the in the, in a, the big game indicating dogs in a circle. And for those that are listening or watching this on YouTube or Facebook or listening on the podcast, um, the Big Game Indicating Dogs Inner Circle is a closed Facebook group for people who have brought or subscribed to the Deer Dog Training Blueprint. And the Deer Dog Training Blueprint is a 15 part, sorry, a 12 part, 15 hour video series where we just filmed everything I did to train my own Deer Dog from start to finish. Uh, huge amount of information in it. It's the full story. It's all there. And, and when you sign up, you get a huge amount of um, sort of follow-up support like these Q&As. And um, anyone that signs up uh, is, is really supporting us to to carry on and do things like these Q&As and make free videos and make more products like the Deer Dog Training Blueprints. Pretty much all about helping people to train dogs or training people to train dogs. That's our tagline. So... Um, cheers guys thanks everyone and um, we'll see you later